Tonight, back in Bangladesh, Nobel laureate Muhammad Yunus returns to his home country to lead the caretaker government. Major Quick, Japan is hit with a magnitude of 7.1 earthquake causing tsunami warnings. Authorities continue to assess the damage. Escalating conflict. Ukraine's invasion into Russia territory causes the Kremlin to declare a state of emergency. Masked Marvels. Benin celebrates tradition and culture with artistic festivities. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ada Derna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo. Here's Aquil Qureshi. Good evening. You're joining us on World News this Thursday evening. I'm Aquil Qureshi. We have lots of key updates to bring to you tonight, starting with the unrest in Bangladesh. Nobel laureate Mohammed Yunus landed in Bangladesh ahead of being sworn in as the country's interim leader. The 84-year-old arrived just days after Sheikh Hasina, the woman who ruled Bangladesh with an iron fist for 15 years, fled across the borders to India. Before boarding his flight back to Bangladesh, Mohammed Yunus appeared optimistic about the big job ahead of him. Hello, hello. Hello, how are you, sir? Yes, I'm looking forward to going back home and uh, see what's happening here and how we can organize ourselves to get out of the trouble that we are in. Early Wednesday, the Nobel Peace Laureate was officially named chief advisor of Bangladesh's interim government. After he was specifically requested by leaders of the protest movement that helped drive Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina from power. That followed a violent crackdown that left hundreds of people dead. A mass uprising initially sparked over a quota system for government jobs that grew into a broader challenge to Hasina's 15 year rule. Also on Wednesday, ex Prime Minister and chairperson of Bangladesh's main opposition party, Khaled Azia, was released from years of house arrest. Her party promptly holding a rally to celebrate. I'm a dead. As calm begins to return to Dhaka, with schools and garment factories reopening on Wednesday, a court overturned a conviction against Yunus, a labor charge condemned as politically motivated. Yunus has said he now wants to hold elections within a few months. A powerful 7.1 magnitude earthquake struck southwestern Japan today, leading to tsunami advisories for the Pacific coast of the Kuashu and the Shikoku Islands. Initially reported as a magnitude of 6.9, the earthquake prompted warnings of the possible tsunamis up to one meter high. The Japan Meteorological Agency said an earthquake with a magnitude of 7.1 hit southwestern Japan, triggering tsunami advisories, but there were no immediate signs of major damage. Weather cameras in Miyazaki and Oita prefectures shook strongly when the quake occurred off Miyazaki Prefecture on the western major island of Kyushu. Chief Cabinet Secretary Yoshimasa Hayashi said there have been no reports of abnormalities at nuclear power plants following the quake, and the government is checking for damage and and casualties. In Miyazaki, waves as high as 50 centimetres have already been observed. Over in the UK, thousands of police and anti-racism protesters gathered on streets across Britain to challenge expected far-right groups that filed uh, to materialise following more than a week of violence racist attack targeting Muslims and migrants. <laughs> A message heard across the UK on Wednesday as thousands took to the streets to counter planned anti-immigration demonstrations. Gathering in cities like London, Liverpool, Birmingham and Bristol, anti-racism demonstrators aim to outnumber far-right rioters and counter the recent scenes of violence and hate. Some demonstrators gathered to protect organisations specialising in immigration believed to be possible targets for far-right groups. In London, over a thousand extra officers were ready to deploy amid concerns of yet another night of violence that has marred the country over the past week. Despite clashes with some far-right agitators, many locations were more peaceful than expected. The recent rioting comes after the suspected killer of three young girls was wrongly identified as an asylum seeker, and a subsequent online anti-immigration campaign took to the streets and turned violent. 
Recent events have sparked fears among minority groups in a country where immigrants make up 15% of the population. Communities that the counter-protesters have rallied to support. Updates now in the war in Israel. It was stated that Israeli remains dedicated to finding, attacking and potentially killing Hamas new leader Yahya Sinwar. The U.S. has also expressed concern about the appointment, calling Sinva a brutal terrorist. Israel's military chief of staff has vowed to target the new Hamas leader, Yahya Sinwar. Speaking during a visit to an Air Force base on Wednesday, Lieutenant General Herzi Halavi said the decision to name Sinwar as its new leader will not absolve him from the fact that he is a murderer. We will make an effort to find him and attack him, and they can replace once again the head of the political borough. Sinwar is believed to be the mastermind behind the October 7th attack when Hamas killed more than a thousand people during an attack on Israel, including citizens from other countries. Israel's attack on Gaza continued despite the change in Hamas's leadership. The Israeli army issued new evacuation orders on Wednesday for Beit Hanun in northern Gaza. This comes as Israel announced it would forcefully and immediately operate against terror groups in the region, following a rocket attack fired from the area. Meanwhile, top Iranian commander Abdel Rahim Mousavi welcomed the appointment of Sinwar as the new political head of Hamas, calling him a great combatant. He added that the new leadership means that Israel will have to give up hopes of survival and collapse. Hamas on Tuesday chose Sinwar as its new leader after Ismail Haniyeh was killed in Iran last week by a strike which is presumed to have been launched by Israel. Regional tensions have soared after the killing. Moving on to Russia, a state of emergency has been declared in Kursk, region of the country, as a rare cross-border attack by Ukrainian forces continued for a second day. According to the Kremlin, the highlighted areas in these images indicate Ukrainian army positions within the southwest Russian region of Kursk before they're hit with artillery. This Russian military handout claims to show a helicopter attacking yet more Ukrainian forces in Kursk. In a video meeting with President Vladimir Putin, Russia's top general vowed to crush what appears to be a major raid by Ukrainian troops into Russian territory. Putin called it a large-scale provocation as he convened a number of emergency government meetings. Though it's not Ukraine's first military operation inside Russia, the incursion marks the first time regular Ukrainian army troops have taken part. Moscow says up to a thousand Ukrainian soldiers, along with dozens of tanks and armored vehicles, crossed the border north of the Ukrainian town of Sumy, with one line of attack making significant headway towards the Russian town of Suja. Kremlin sources say Ukrainian shelling has killed several civilians in Suja and forced thousands more to evacuate. Kiev has yet to comment on the situation beyond a subtle reference from President Volodymyr Zelensky on Wednesday. The more pressure exerted on Russia, on the aggressor that brought the war to Ukraine, the closer peace will be. Just peace through just force. Analysts have questioned the wisdom of such an operation at a moment when Ukrainian troops are already overstretched and outgunned along the lines of Russia's invasion inside their own territory. Washington, Kiev's top military and financial backer, says it is seeking clarification from Ukrainian leaders about their objectives. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. On the road to the White House tonight, one day after Vice President Kamala Harris announced Minnesota's governor, Tim Wiles, as her running mate, the two spent campaigning in the battleground states of Wisconsin and Michigan. At one point, they nearly crossed paths with their opponents, Senator J.D. Wands, on a tarmac in Wisconsin. Tonight, the race for the White House in full swing, with both campaigns battling to win the Midwest. Air Force Two and J.D. Vance's campaign plane meeting on the tarmac. I just wanted to check out my future plane. Holding dueling rallies in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. How great it is to be here in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Good afternoon, Wisconsin! 
Vice President Kamala Harris and her new running mate, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz, on the trail for their first full day of campaigning, drawing another huge crowd. So in the next 90 days, we need you to use your power. We need you to knock on doors. We need you to register folks to vote. We need you to energize and organize and mobilize and make your voices heard. The campaign saying they've raised $36 million in the 24 hours since Walls has been on the ticket. A new poll out today shows Harris and Donald Trump effectively tied among likely Wisconsin voters. Harris hoping Walls from bordering Minnesota will help them take the state. New rivals, Vance and Walls, both veterans. Vance, who deployed to Iraq in the Marines and did not see any active fighting, going after Walls' military background, accusing him of leaving his unit before it deployed to Iraq and lying about his service, seizing on this moment. And we can make sure that those weapons of war that I carried in war is the only place where those weapons are at. He has not spent a day in a combat zone. What bothers me about Tim Waltz is the stolen valor garbage. Do not pretend to be something that you're not. Wall served in the Army National Guard for 24 years and has never claimed to have seen active combat, despite those comments that he carried a gun in war. He retired honorably in 2005 to run for Congress as the crisis in Iraq was growing. The Harris campaign saying in a statement, the governor carried, fired, and trained others to use weapons of war innumerable times. Governor Walls would never insult or undermine any American service to this country. In fact, he thanks Senator Vance for putting his life on the line for our our country. It's the American way. Challenges. Walls hitting right back. What, Donald Trump, he sees the world differently than we see it. NASA states that the Boeing Starliner crew stranded on the International Space Station could be stuck there until February 2025. It's now mulling a possible rescue mission using a rival SpaceX vehicle as serious safety concerns with the Starliner drag on. A shocking new setback in Boeing's Starliner saga. Tonight, NASA says astronauts Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams may now have to wait until February before returning to Earth and possibly with Elon Musk's company, SpaceX. Officials breaking the news on a teleconference today. We know that uh, at some point we need to bring Butch and Sonny home. The two launching into orbit back in June on Starliner's first ever crew mission. The eight-day mission now stretching into months as NASA works to fix Starliner's thrusters and helium leaks. They're working very hard on the ground to make sure that we uh, will be able to come home before too long. Tonight, NASA says it is still focused on bringing Wilmore and Williams home on Starliner, but the agency acknowledging it is seriously evaluating other options for their return. A string of 13 straight months with a new average heat record came onto the end in July, according to the new European climate agency, Corpus Nucus. Both the agencies and outside expressed uh, warned that the end of the record breaking streak changes nothing but the threat posing by climate change. The month was 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit above the pre-industrial average. Still high, but also short of July in 2023. Beginning June last year, the streak saw each month become the hottest on record since 1940. Copernicus links high temperatures mainly to greenhouse emissions from fossil fuels. Above average temperatures were seen around the globe, in southern and eastern Europe, the western US, western Canada, as well as Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and eastern Antarctica. Ocean surface temperatures also stayed unusually high in many areas. Researchers in Scotland hope to lead the way in tackling cybercrime with the development of a national quantum network that could revolutionise data security and establish the UK as a global leader in quantum innovation. A team of researchers in Scotland is hoping to revolutionise data security by developing a potentially unhackable national quantum network. The Integrated Quantum Networks Hub, or IQN, will be led by a group from Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh. It is one of five hubs announced by the UK government as part of a $200 million government investment. 
The aim of the IQN is to boost cybersecurity by enhancing defences against hacking and connecting future quantum computers. Charlotte Dean, Executive Chair of the UK's Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, says programming on a quantum computer is very different from programming on a classical computer. The quantum internet uses principles of quantum mechanics and artificial intelligence to create unbreakable encryption keys. The project also aims to tackle cybercrime, projected to cost the world about $9.5 trillion a year by the end of 2024. Authentic ID's State of Identity fraud report says. Cybersecurity expert Andrew Patel cautions that no system will ever be impervious to the main weak link in the chain, people. The UK hopes these new quantum hubs will pave the way for the country to become a global leader in quantum innovation. The hubs are expected to drive entrepreneurship, workforce development and regulatory input into the UK's rapidly emerging quantum industry. Let's go into a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. All to Nova Street's bustled with a vibrant West African masquerade culture during the weekend's inaugural mask festival. As colourful characters including straw-clad characters and slit dancers typically reserved for village rituals paraded through Benin's capital. The festival showcased a diverse array of masks, both in sacred and secular, from the Benin and neighbouring countries, masquerades, societies in West Africa, deeply rooted in local cultures, serve multiple roles from spiritual mediation to social regulations. These often secretive groups use elaborate masks and costumes in performances that combine dance, music and theatre believed to channel spirits or ancestors during important occasions. And with that we mark the end of today's bulletin. We'll see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings across the globe. Stay tuned as Anuradha Wickramasinghe will join you next with Nightly Business Report. Thank you for watching. Good night.